some of you may have seen the painting. Uh, I think it's off the Triangle Embankment or something. There's a group of Morris dancers down the front. Richmond. Richmond, thank you. And there's a bunch of dandies watching them. What is not known is that those dandies went home and thought, anything they can do, meaning that first dance, we can do better. So this is Regency Morris. Uh, four Regency bows and their ladies. <laughs>
surviving dance from that fateful meeting between Warlock and Wilmington I. So that's one less. So Richards, always bring your own Then you put the looks tidy.
Five anonymous teams, only one of you have a name. You know, the rest I shall have to call by your numbers. Um, I'll give some brief comments on each team and then give you some time on the fashion. First team, nice fit to the music, very good flow and show. Pity you didn't all actually do the same stepping at the same time. Picky, picky!
natural state of development is, was, or is, depending on quarry, is actually a really strong set. She's doing better than all else. And otherwise, she's a dumb bit of the nut. But it's a strong dumb. But try and keep the relative angle. What I hate to see are people who do a side step by, in effect, swinging their feet over. You know, they actually do that. Come down, ever snatch and get. What I don't like about that is 
I find no evidence of Daneward movement, Daneward drive in the cops for Morris. There is another form of Morris, but the business, you know, going into the grain is not part of cops for Morris. Cops for Morris is all then up and off the grain and rising, not driving in grain. It's not earthy in that sort of sense. Right? Um, I say, whatever I say is more quite sure But I don't like that sort of movement, gain into the grain and things like this. When you look at it from the side, it's aesthetically not as good as actually the lift and raising of something to a movement, as well as not being traditional. Right? Which doesn't really matter except for a workshop like this. Right? <coughs> so what are we going to do? We're going to face up, we're going to dance. A size set and half page dance. A size set and half page does not have galleys in it, so we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about that in the next dance. We dance on the spot facing up. We back step and jump to face across, turning in that field tail. Show one is facing out. Right? Then we dance down, facing down, and turn the face in. Left foot first half, right foot. Second half. The chorus starts with the right foot, which means you've got to have jumps and land with feet together. There's no use landing on one foot and having on wrong foot in the air. I mean, it's quite possible to land like that and then start the side step. It doesn't look very good. Right. Side step straight in front with this point. And half A with the backing up and down the line twice. Half jerk. Back to back, round, end on a course. Most field chain dancers end on a course. Not all, there's almost an exception to every rule, but most do. Let's try the walk of the Tutney Postman, which actually is a tune to Gary Owens. Gary Owens is the signature or march of the 7th Cavalry, American Cavalry, that is. I was playing by Custer's band as they charged the battle of the Big Horn, which they lost. That's a very good idea. Well, happened on my birthday. <laughs> well, well, on the same day. I didn't think you were going to do it. Sorry. One time is a Right. There is a problem. I don't think the post went tough um, until after the two came inside and stopped. There's still plenty of post in its day, so there's a little bit of weirdness about it. Could we refer to the postman to pay rather than the postman yes, to pay? Ah, I haven't thought about that. Yes. Tums or what? Tums an hour. Oh, that's a lot of money then. For those who are interested, General Monk was paid six shillings a day when he was in the Commonwealth Army. And he didn't have to do it then. That's not really useful to pay for either, but it's something I can remember. Right, come on.
Um, A, um, three Bs, and one C.
capers. Right, plain capers, <coughs> plain capers, then the slows. Beta crushers and then the uprights. Right? It's the uprights that tend to get a bit more difficult because so people do flail their legs around a bit. We've got a small set. Right. Back to where you start the dance, we're all face up from the triangulation.
didn't do several, because every time you did an extra dance, you were expecting something more and put the kitty in, and the people of the audience were in fact keen on you. Right? So you have a long. Now, what do I mean by a long version? Well, that means the first corner does the, the corner movement, which is long in scope of sense, uh, one and two, one and two, then cross over the diagonal, one, two, and gabby. Then the next <coughs> corner does it, then the third corner does it, then the first corner do two slow capers facing in the middle. Right. Then the second corner, then the third, and then the first corner do the side step crossing all the way back again. Now, this doesn't make it exact for the longest dance in the world, I think one way of doing it is to put it back to the longest dance in the world. Yeah. But it is very long boring. So, even dearest thinking, if you read Sean, was collected that you did a corner moon across starting with the left foot, and having all three corners done it, you came back starting on the right foot. Uh, for symmetry and so on. So, again, it added up and added up. Have you ever done longer trunkles with all the variety of the slow papers? You can do that for 13 minutes. They really launched in your job. Well, it's always the ideas, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah um, different culture, different sort of way of doing it. So, there's this long winded way of doing the dance, which I don't think anybody does. Except <laughs> there are always exceptions. Now the usual simplification is that when you get to the slows bit, all six do them together. Right? You do it all facing in a ring, and you dance two slows going to the middle and caper back to place. Right? And then you do the crossing back. Or better still, you don't do the crossing back. Right? Because uh, that short dance day is starting to get reasonable now in terms of sort of length. Now what I'm going to suggest to you is an even shorter way of doing it. Which is, hmm? of course, yeah. which is that all six of you do the corner crossing together. Right. Now let's get you in from your set and let's just work on that. You're facing your diagonal. Side, long side step to your right, basically. Side step and a double step. Side step and a double step. Right. And they were all going to cross, enhancing right shoulders in the middle, keeping the same relative order. You just need a bit of courage, and that's all. <laughs> when you get there, Gally.
know that we are near where we started. But don't worry, trust me, you'll get back to where we started in the end.
Theoristically, actually, it has the way I'm going to do it. Actually, has three
weeks of back lunch and sprains with these courses in between.
ones who got it from somebody else. So I don't know who originated the first version of it. But I know. The next version of it is the six. But this time if you've lost one. Is that right? Never had to start. Right. The difference here is that we're going to, instead of doing corners with two, we're going to do corners with three people.
days when, in fact, signposts look like that. James calling the signposts anymore because they actually look more like this. There's also the ritual cursing yeah. done, but we don't do that sort of paganism business, do we? Yeah. <laughs> we all do, shouldn't we? Jameson. I
the first time it was just a ground going into the middle. No problem. The second and third time it's rounds going in the middle but with slow cables. Right, we now need to soon can play it because she's looking for it. Right, so let's try the road.
Now, bearing in mind that 125 pints of beer went last night, I'm wondering whether I need to buy more beer, or whether some of the beer drinkers are sufficient to cider, or whether the cider drinkers are happy enough to take home some of the cider and pay for it at 90 pence a pint, so I don't make a loss. I could try and negotiate a complete barrel of cider. Give me some guidance. <coughs> Valiant people that feel that either during this evening and tomorrow or taking it home in plastic bottles, you will get rid of the side which is available. Yes? I'll need that. In that case, No use walking around the forest looking for one that's going to be. Partly because they don't come off in pairs. Secondly, you have problems twitching them to anything. You really want to have them cut across in an angle of bevel and then make it on a like a small shield with a handle at the bottom. Now the next thing is that. It's no use driving around the countryside trying to run them over. <laughs> this is an unrewarding way. <laughs> it's inefficient. But you can get them because, in fact, deers are deer farm nowadays. You can get them through the system. Now, the system, as far as I'm concerned, is you start with your local game shop and actually say you want a head with horn. So the next time he gets a carcass in, you know, he'll chop the head off and you get it. With, with fur and everything? Oh, everything. Oh, yeah. 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 Now everybody's sitting yeah. perfectly yeah. full yeah. from eating too much. Yeah. What yeah. you do, <laughs> how you prepare it, and this is, you know, we were instructed by our local supplier, get a large saucepan, you know, like a, um, a big pan that you do jam in and things like that, and you put the head in it and boil it. Right. Who's head? Yours When a friend is coming to the kitchen and they see this big saucepan with a lid on it, took an awful lot of explaining. When we explained, they didn't believe it. <laughs> but you do that. But now, actually, there is like pig's head or lamb's head. You know, you can actually make brawn from the bits and pieces. But nowadays, yeah, yeah, yeah. nowadays you don't because you've no idea what the bloody disease the thing had in yeah. the first place. <laughs> Having cooked it enough to loosen all the bits, what we then did was put it like that on the roof of the garage for a month or two and let the birds and insects and things come and strip it all off and let the weather wash all the bits of it so you end up like that with all these lovely little bones You've got a residence association, right? Well, you don't really want these <laughs> you know, You're still like, only trying to cut the head off but you do actually have a problem Oh yeah, yeah. 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 It's not the sort of thing I think you wear on your head <laughs> I've got only two of them. <laughs> you know, it's I think we couldn't have faced doing any more of them. And the worst is when you say, I'm going to And all through the, you know, the night, you can hear these horns being dragged around on the roof. <laughs> Something or other was actually moving away. Yeah, I didn't want to know. <laughs> Now, there are some problems that game shops don't necessarily get um, a complete carcass in normally. The people who actually breed and you know, feed them up and so on actually tend to chop the head off and keep this bit. 
I don't know whether it's an aphrodisiac for some Chinese or something or other, but there apparently is some sort of market for them. Um, the other people I know who in the past have got horns, like I think the Morris side at Yule, um, it was to go to the, the range of, of Windsor Park type thing, you know, where there's a herd, and um, actually just ask whether in fact a set can be, when they're shedding them, can actually be gathered in. It is possible that way. But you have to find who to talk to and what time of the year to actually remind him of it. Yeah. No, have you mentioned your <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they made a gigantic mistake. And I really mean gigantic. They thought, oh, we're not going to trouble with real horns. We'll get some fiberglass made, one made up. And they arranged for somebody to borrow a set of horns that actually could be made of fiberglass. They didn't actually check the original. So what they found they had were six sets of the largest moose horns. <laughs> <laughs> they look like, to me, they look like the sort of thing you go down Brighton Pier and try and fly with. So beware. But the great thing about this is that's just about the right hat size. You, know, you can wave them. And the other thing you appreciate is that if you're going to do a dance with horns with six or eight of you, yeah. You actually need to get six sets of these into your car, or somebody's car, you know, and big ones don't go into vehicles very easily. These, like, well, these pack surprisingly well, you know, they sort of stuff them inside each other quite happily. So that right. Right, now, who does a horn dance? Well, there's Abbott's problem, of course. Um, they were carbon dated to you know, the order 1200 AD. Uh, they're reindeer horns, and there weren't any reindeer in England at that time. So there's a slight problem about where they come from. And I'm, I'm fairly convinced that nobody local imported sets of reindeer horns just for dances. <laughs> you, know, uh, you might do it nowadays, but I'm sure they didn't learn. So that's obviously. The first mention, though, of the uh, Abbot's from dance is more of it's about the hobby horse and his dancers, you know, emphasising the characters first. There is a, an evidence, so there is one reference which suggests that in fact they dance during the year, not just it wakes, you know, during the year, to raise funds for the church, which is common in the sort of Tudor period anyhow, it was a way of raising funds for people who give money, because they didn't have money to give, if it were, you know, uh, done a sort of somewhat different sort of way of raising money. And the what the movements are, the sort of crossings and the weavings and things like this, fit very well with the surviving description of Tudor Morris of haze and circling and things, you know, the same sort of words. And it could well be that it's Bromley dance. It's the only Tudor Morris dance we actually got. No, uh, I only said it's a possibility, I'm not saying it's true. Um, but you've got to bear in mind that we actually know precious little about the actual dancers before 1700. <coughs> so that's Abbott's problem. Um, in the 19th century, they were perambulating the uh, whole of the parish. That the village tradition is that they were there because they went when the, the parish boundaries, sort of beacon of boundaries, to establish their rights for the wood and local forest. You know, so many of these customs are uh, perambulating that way because you're trying to maintain your right, as it were which is a customary right, and you only keep a customary right going by keep going, having the right, is it really? You, know, you have to keep on doing it. So there's probably, a, there is evidence that, you know, one of the reasons for the origin was that. Right. Um, in the 19th century, they wore old clothes with ribbons, tatters, and things of that sort on them. You know, just ordinary clothes, like ordinary Jeff turned inside out and a bit of stuff all over, things of that sort. And then, at the back end of the century, the vicar's wife, use the vicar's curtains that got a bit worn uh, to make them a set of Tudor-like costume. And they've reproduced that at least once, if not twice in the last century, um, as a way of doing it. So what you see at Abbott's Bromley has some roots a long way back, like the beginning of the Tudor period at least, you know, as a, a down 
plants and things like this, but the appearance of them is actually relatively modern, even though they look you know, good and old-fashioned and so on. Sharp went to Abbott's Bromley, of course. Mind you, so did um, Evans, the, the better Stratford went and uh, interviewed people you know, in the background. And a woman living in school teacher and they wrote a book about their background and the tunes and things of that sort. But Sharp went there and he wasn't very happy what he saw. He didn't like the fact that we were playing on modern tunes and things like this and went off and played this fiddler Robinson, who might have played as long as ago as 1850, who played dee dum, dee dum, dee dum, dee dum, dee 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 Nobody's ever found anybody who actually remembers it being used, you know. Um, the character of Abbott's Bromley, as I hope you'll see in the video, is in fact good brisk tunes. If you're going to walk 15 to 20 miles during the day, carrying something that's costly weighs between 40 and 80 pounds, you know, the whole style of movement is dominated by the fact that you're having to walk a long way carrying a weight, not because in fact you're dancing. And if you've ever seen the sort of Thaxted or EFGSS inspired display, which are very rich or like and very dramatic, it isn't like that. Right? You know, that's just another thing. That's the way the FGS, you know, <coughs> chose to present it. And look, it is a good way, you know. Um, certainly in the past when we wanted to is it was sell the idea of folk and the folk traditions and you know, the survivors and so on, it was actually worth putting on these very dramatic performances. So that's the way it's been. Um, I've mentioned Thaxted already. Uh, Thaxted, at the end of the Thaxted re-meeting, they date back to before the ring, a long time before the ring, uh, of, for a long time, as dusk appears, uh, the Thaxted men come on with a set of horns and dance to Robinson's tune, and it's very atmospheric and very impressive, and if you ever get the chance, I do recommend going along and actually seeing it. The one or two other teams, I mentioned you all, who actually do something, uh, um, another one was Rolf Gardner at Fontenot Magna. Um, that's not the, uh, I forgot the real name of the place, is there? Fontenot at the middle, isn't it? Springhead. Springhead, the Springhead, yeah, lot. They did a dance, uh, uh, a horn dance as well. And he was one of those who felt it not only wasn't right to copy the Abbots Bromley dance, but he didn't think much of the Abbots Bromley dance in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they actually had for many years, uh, well, many years, 20 to 30, 30 years sort of thing, uh, a good dance, which was more Morris-like, you know, had more figures and things of that sort. Um, and really, um, other than the odd occasion at festivals, I'm not sure of anybody, any side that has done a regular performance of horn dance, either here or, or in the States and so on. Um, and I think it's mostly because of just the sheer inconvenience. Pinewoods, yes. Yeah. Yes, you're right. I've forgotten that. Did you try and sort of class or something? I had an inquiry about it from the States. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it's part of these sort of workshops that, in fact, we ought to, you know, you actually know, need to know something and meet the dance both see it visually and also have a try on what it is. Um, I was paid by um, London ITV to teach the dance for a children's programme. They were, had a series of sort of mysteries and this particular one, the plot was this young boy who was very close to his grandfather. Uh, they talked about the, um, the deer dance and things like that and in his dream he then, um, it's only a short time, but in his dream, he actually saw all these deer dancers coming through the woods where his, father would work, his grandfather worked. And then, at the moment his grandfather died, the sixth dancer appeared in the set, you know, and they proceeded to do the dance. Now, the way it came to me, it was a bit funny, you know, somebody saying, well, you know, we want, want a horn dance, you know, but we don't know anybody who knows one. You know, I've got a record on set, so I said, oh, I'll go along. And I'll show them my silly film. You know. And I arrived at the studio, and this group of men, dancers, had just actually done a show with. Um, oh, who names the stage at the moment? Um, 
Barbara Streisand, that's right. <laughs> 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 oh, nobody negligible, yes. Yeah. It just uh, shows is the dancers with that, you know. And they were at all key at this <laughs> top, I might say, you know. And they thought, him, you know, they took it at me and someone, what's he know? He's not a dancer, he's not a professional, you know, he's an engineer, you know, he saw the dance was quite amusing, really. No, I it. Uh, um, still, we sh I showed them the film and they looked at it and uh, they said, what we're going to do? And they said, well, you know, the sound, the way of practice is you pick up a chair, you know, upside down and you proceed to do it. Really. So they went through it and we actually learned the dance as it was. You know, and you can see they weren't impressed. <laughs> then they suddenly realised at the tea break that actually they're being paid to learn this and do it. You know, so they then settled down into saying, all right, now what about camera angles? So they're organising something. How are we going to lay a relative to the camera? What we're going to do? You know, this is there. And they got going. And within sort of 20 minutes of actually sorting them south eight, they were sort of saying, let's do it again. Let's do it again. Oh, I like this. You know, let's get on and do it again. And there they were. We left, you know. And there they were actually with no. The producer had gone. The um, research worker had gone. And they're actually just enjoying themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was quite incredible. Really. Um, and when it came to, um, although we they sort of learnt this was set for horns, as it were, the film of it. When it came on the television program, they actually had the horns on their head. You know, it's a part of a helmet type thing. You know, a bit disappointing, really. I don't know why I bothered. Well, oh, I do. Uh, 150 yes. quid. <laughs> <laughs> it's all rather fun to get involved. Well, all right then. That's part of the after it's over. Can we show the video? Yeah, I think I might have DJ in the TV, so I'll bear with you. <laughs> There's the door.
The secretary was quite proud to explain to me a bit the moral stats they had, but they turned it out to be carnival troops. You know, so the heirs at the Olympic Games of Longburn Morris are girls' carnival troops. Staffordshire, you see, it's far enough north to think that's normal. 
Um, <laughs> is there any chance of seeing that later, that that bridge thing? Because people haven't seen it. it, it yeah, it's, it's on if there's <coughs> well, will you all stand up and pick your chair up? Oh, there was something crawling across, 
Well, don't hold it there. Probably will eat
two deer are actually challenging each other, not necessarily the fight to the death. Right? So, now, having said that, you know how to do the challenges, you know how to do the forward and back. So, when you're doing the circuit round, you say lines, you form up the lines, and you start the forward and back, and through the crossing over, and when number one wants to, you say off, and off you go, winding around. So, right? so let's have a little bit of maths out of the problem. How is that tonight? Anxious to do with some of the chair. Right, again.